Shalom, everyone. Thank you for joining us. And this is our second reading of the Citizen Rule Book. This is actually a copy that's attached to the back of Carl Miller's book that he wrote. But the Citizen Rule Book was made by a, a different individual in the 1970s. And uh, you can buy these online still to hand out. <clears throat> We left off reading through and we got through the Ten Commandments and these few quotes by some of the founders, Andrew Jackson and Noah Webster. And now we're on the summary of the Communist Manifesto. So we'll just jump right into it. It says, the Communist Manifesto represents a misguided philosophy which teaches the citizens to give up their rights for the sake of the common good but it always ends up in a police state. This is called preventive justice. Control is the key concept. Read carefully. 1. Abolition of private property. 2. Heavy progressive income tax. 3. Abolition to all rights of inheritance. 4. Confiscation of property of all immigrants and rebels. 5. A central bank. 6. Government control of communications and transportation. 7. Government ownership of factories and agriculture. 8. Government control of labor. 9. Corporate farms, regional planning. 10. Free education for all children in government-controlled schools. And I'd like to point out again, I've mentioned this before, and we'll eventually read these books for ourselves, but communism, it's a Latin word, communion, right? Commune, communist manifesto. Anyways, communism was created by the Jesuits. They perfected it in Paraguay, South America, in their reductiones where they enslaved the indigenous Indians. And they were so happy with the form of uh, government or the structure that they had created there that during their council of Cherie in 1825 or 1824, the one that was overheard by Jacopo Leone, they had mentioned that this was the form of government or the type of control system, communism, that they were going to use to help take over the world. So, and if you go down this list, you see that most of it's already being implemented in our country, contrary to the Constitution and our constitutional republic that we have under the common law. Let's give up rights for the common good. When the people fear the government, you have tyranny. When the government fears the people, you have liberty. Politicians, bureaucrats, and especially judges would have you believe that too much freedom will result in chaos. Therefore, we should gladly give up some rights for the good of the community. In other words, people acting in the name of government say we need more laws and more jurors to enforce these laws even if we have to give up some more rights in the process. They believe the more laws we have, the more control, thus a better society. This theory may sound good on paper, and apparently many of our leaders think this way, as evidenced by the thousands of new laws that are added to the books each year in this country. And the leaders are doing that because they're adding to municipal law, civil law, which is contradiction. It's contrary to the common law, but it is Babylonian and Roman. That's why they're doing that, because they work for the enemy. But the people, as the jurors and as the rightful rulers of this nation, we don't have to continue allowing it to happen. All we have to do is say no. But no matter how cleverly this Marxist argument is made, the hard fact is that whenever you give up a right 
you lose a free choice. This adds another control. Control's real name is bondage. The logical conclusion would be, if giving up some rights produces a better society, then by giving up all rights we could produce the perfect society. We could chain everybody to a tree for lack of trust. This may prevent a crime, but it would destroy privacy, which is the heartbeat of freedom. And if you realize how much they steal our information, unlawfully, but even now openly, they don't give us any privacy. And we are losing our freedom because we're in sin against our creator as a nation. It would also destroy trust, which is the foundation for dignity. Rather than giving up rights, we should be giving up wrongs. The opposite of control is not chaos. More laws do not make less criminals. We must give up wrongs, not rights, for a better society. William Penn of the British House of Commons once proclaimed, Necessity is the plea for every infringement of man's liberty. It is the argument of tyrants. It is the creed of slaves. Inalienable, unalienable, or, or natural rights. And there's a distinction. Inalienable rights are rights that are given that you can alienate of yourself, that you can freely give up through contract or other means like 14th amendment rights right the rights given by the state but unalienable unalienable not to be separated from or not to be having a lien against you are rights endowed and given from your creator which no man not even yourself has the right to relinquish it's only under delusion that you lose these. It's not possible to do so. And that would be the right to life, the right to liberty, the right to travel, the right to work and do whatever labor you so choose in a lawful manner without permission from the state. No licenses to go hunting or fishing or driving or nursing or being a firefighter or being a gunsmith or doing anything you want. You don't need to ask permission from anyone. And the whole farce system they have set up is to control and, and limit, to deny our rights and to usurp the system that's in place. So all of that has to go by the wayside. We might, in, by the will of the people, put in things that would require those that are in positions of public servants like nurses or anyone who might be doing things that require, um, that risk the benefit or health of another. They might have requirements for competency or things that we can put in at the will and agreement of the people, but not arbitrary laws that require a permission from the state and fees. That's unconstitutional. It's criminal and it needs to stop. But it says natural rights are those rights such as life from conception liberty and the pursuit of happiness e.g. freedom from or freedom of religion speech learning travel self defense etc hence laws and statutes which violate natural rights though they have the color of law are not law but impostors and that goes for every so called gun law in any state or federal legislation Void from enactment, because shall not be infringed is the supreme law of the land. And these criminals are traitors to their constitution, to the oath they swore when they do these things. We have to not allow it to happen anymore. But it says, the U.S. Constitution was written to protect these natural rights from being tampered with by legislators. Further, our forefathers also wisely knew that the U.S. Constitution would be utterly worthless to restrain government legislators unless it was clearly comprehended that the people had the right to compel the government to keep within the constitutional limits. It's the bounds by which the, the government is set, as Thomas Jefferson you said it. 
And that's what we have to enforce. In a jury trial, the real judges are the jurors. Surprisingly, judges are actually just referees bound by the Constitution. And this whole farce that you have going on where they can make judicial fiat and rule contrary to what we have established from the beginning is also void from enactment. There's legis there's already jurisprudence that talks about how the courts and judges have no right to do that. But because we're ignorant to these things and these Jesuits don't care about the truth, it gets trampled on. But it's actually out there. Anything they do where a gov like when the original Supreme Court or the judges had ruled Roe versus Wade and allowed abortion. That should have been void from enactment because it's contrary to the right to life. And if we had known our, our laws better, that would have never happened. The same thing with every arbitrary rule, everything that they've put in place that's contrary to what is written, like the mandatory federal holiday of Christmas. The literal abomination that desolates set up by Sixtus III that was brought in by Ulysses S. Grant in our country. Within a generation of that, skin cancer started to appear. The grievous sore on men, which was part of that plague being poured out that's mentioned in Revelation. So there's a lot of this stuff that we just aren't mindful of, but there's serious effects that are happening in reality because of them. We need to actually pay more attention and take this stuff seriously. <clears throat> it says here, in a jury trial, I already read that part, but we'll do it again. The real judges are the jurors. Surprisingly, judges are actually just referees bound by the Constitution. Lansander, or Lysander Spooner, in his book, Essay on the Trial by Jury, wrote as follows. Government is established for the protection of the weak against the strong. This is the principle, if not the sole motive, for the establishment of all legitimate government. It is only the weaker party that loses their liberties when a government becomes oppressive. The stronger party in all governments are free by virtue of their superior strength. They never oppress themselves. Legislation is the work of the stronger party, and if in addition to the sole power of legislation, they have the sole power of determining what legislation shall be enforced, they have all power in their hands, and the weaker party are the subjects of an absolute government. Unless the weaker party have a veto, they have no power whatever in the government and to the power or and sorry no liberties the trial by jury is the only institution that gives the weaker party any veto power upon the power of the stronger consequently it is the only institution that gives them any effective voice in the government or any guarantee against oppression and that was only excerpts and parts of that whole quote. There's breaks in it right there. <clears throat> jury tampering, a jury's rights, powers, and duties. The charge of the jury in the first jury trial before the Supreme Court of the United States illustrates the true power of the jury. In the February term of 1794, the Supreme Court, sorry, the Supreme, Supreme is not capitalized in the Constitution. However, behavior is, Article 3. So the Supreme Court conducted a jury trial and said, quote, It is presumed that the jurors or the juries are the best judges of facts. It is, on the other hand, presumed that the court are the best judges of law, but still both objects are within your power of decision. Unquote. Here's another one. You have a right to take upon yourselves to judge of both and to, de and to determine the law as well as the fact in controversy. 
State of Georgia versus Brailsford at L. Three Doll One. The jury has an unreviewable and unrevisable power to acquit in disregard of the instructions on the law given by the trial judge. U.S. vs. Doherty, and that was a court case in 1972. Anyone who wants to look these up, you can type these, the court case and the date in, and you can usually find them online. Some places like case text, you'll have to fill in your information and your email and they'll send it to you. But it says, hence, jury disregard to the limited and generally conviction-oriented evidence presented for its consideration and jury disregard for what the trial judge wants them to believe is the controlling law of any particular case, sometimes referred to as jury lawlessness. Jury lawlessness means willingness to nullify bad law. It is not something to be scrupulously avoided, but rather encouraged. And this is why. We're under the common law, and no man is bound to follow a statute that he did not agree to. That's statutory or contract law, equity, admiralty law. It's all under contract. And they try to get you through fraudulent contracting and our ignorance of the things that they're doing. However... You don't have to agree, and you can demand that they produce the contract before submitting to that jurisdiction. And it really is that simple. But most people, again, we don't know what we're talking about. We don't know anything about these things. And we just get roughshod, uh, pushed around because we're ignorant. And that's why it says in Scripture that my people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. And again, it all stems from sinning against our Creator and not doing things that we should as a nation and individually. It says, witness the following quotation from the eminent legal authority above mentioned. Quote, jury lawlessness is the greatest corrective of law in its actual administration. The will of the state at large imposed on a reluctant community. The will of the majority imposed on a vigorous and determined minority find the same obstacle in the local jury that formerly confronted kings and ministers, meaning they can say not guilty to unrighteous laws, which is what we're required to do. It says the right of the jury to be told of its power. Almost every jury in the land is falsely instructed by the judge when it is told it must accept as the law that which is given to them by the court, and that the jury can decide only the facts in the case. This is to destroy the purpose of the common law jury and to permit the imposition of tyranny upon the people. And this is what they do in all these traffic, all these admiralty courts that they have set up. They never tell the people that these statutes don't really apply, and they can say not guilty because it's not according to the common law, which is scripture. There is nothing more terrifying than ignorance in action. Gothi engraved on the plaque at the Naval War College, and I'm sorry if I butchered his last name, to embarrass justice by a municipality or a multiplicity of laws or to hazard it by confidence in judges are the opposite rocks on which all civil institutions have been wrecked. Johnson engraved in the Minnesota State Capitol outside the Supreme Court chambers. The letter killeth, but the ruach giveth life. 2 Corinthians 3 verse 6. It is error alone which needs the support of government. Truth can stand by itself. Thomas Jefferson. The jury's options are by no means limited to the choices presented to it in the courtroom. The jury gets its comprehension as to the arrangements in the legal system from more than one voice. 
There is the formal communication from the judge. There is the informal communication from the total culture, literature, current comment, conversation, and of course, history and tradition. And that's from Dorothy cited above. Laws, facts, and evidence. Whether the power to decide what facts, law, and evidence are applicable, juries cannot be protected, or juries cannot be a protection to the accused. If people acting in the name of government are permitted by jurors to dictate any law whatever, they can also unfairly dictate what evidence is admissible or inadmissible and thereby prevent the whole truth from being considered. And this is exactly what they do, but they have pre-trial hearings and they go over what can and cannot be presented to the trial jury at the time. It's all garbage and you don't have to agree to any of that. It says, thus, if the government can manipulate and control both the law and evidence, the issue of fact becomes virtually irrelevant. In reality, true justice would be denied, leaving us with a trial by government and not a trial by jury. How does tyranny begin? Why are there so many laws? Heroes are men of esteem who are so honored because of some heroic deed. People often out of gratitude yield allegiance to them. George Washington was an example of that. Andrew Jackson, Andrew Jackson <clears throat> was another war hero that was elected president. He's not the only one. Ulysses S. Grant was also one. Um, it was quite a common thing for that to happen in our country. This is people often found out, or sorry, but people often out of gratitude yielded allegiance to them. Honor and allegiance are nice words for power. Power and allegiance can only be held rightfully by trust as a result of continued character. When people acting in the name of government violate ethics, they break trust with we the people. The natural result is for we, the people, to pull back power, honor, and allegiance. The loss of power creates fear for those losing the power. Fear, or fearing the loss of power, people acting in the name of government often seek to regain or at least hold their power. Hence, to legitimize their quest for control, laws and force are often instituted. Unchecked power is the foundation of tyranny. It is the jury's duty to use the jury room as a vehicle to stem the tide of oppression and tyranny, to prevent bloodshed by peacefully removing power from those who have abused it. The jury is the primary vehicle for the peaceable restoration of liberty, power, and honor to we the people. Your vote counts. And the problem that we have with voting in the system that they have is they have an incorporation instead of a constitutionally uh, de jour government. It's a corporate fiction that you're voting for, for this president and all those elected officials. But on top of that, you can't vote. You can't be in a jury trial in their admiralty courts unless you're registered to vote. All of those being contrary to our actual government. <clears throat> but it says, your vote of not guilty must be respected by all other members of the jury. It is the right and the duty of the juror to never, never, never yield his or her sacred vote. For you are not there as a fool, merely to agree with the majority but as an officer of the court and a qualified judge in your own right, regardless of the pressures or abuse that may be heaped upon you by any other members of the jury with whom you may in good conscience disagree. You can await the reading of the verdict secure in the knowledge that 
you have voted your own conscience and convictions and not those of someone else. You are not a rubber stamp. And you have to keep in mind that you're answerable to your creator alone for how you judge a man. And by the same measure you use, it will be measured to you again. We're to judge with righteous judgment, which is according to the truth, which is his word. This is by what logic do we send out our youth to battle tyranny on foreign soil when we refuse to do so in our courts? Did you know that many of the planks of the Communist Manifesto are now represented by law in the U.S.? How is it possible for Americans to denounce communism and practice it simultaneously? You can't. It's called hypocrisy. The jury judges the ruach or spirit, motive and intent of both the law and the accused, whereas the prosecutor only represents the letter of the law. Therein lies the opportunity for the accomplishment of liberty and justice for all. If you and the numerous other jurors throughout the state and nation begin to con and continue to bring in verdicts of not guilty, in such cases where a man-made statute is defective or oppressive, these statutes will become as ineffective as if they had never been written. If you love wealth better than liberty, and the tranquility of servitude better than the animating contest of freedom, go home from us in shalom or peace. We ask not your counsels nor your arms. Crouch down and lick the hands which feed you. May your chains set lightly upon you, and may posterity forget that you were ever our countrymen. Samuel Adams. All right, this is section two. Give me liberty or give me death. Young Natsari attorney Patrick Henry saw why a jury of peers is so vital to freedom. It was March 1775 when he rode into a small town of Culpeper, Virginia. He was totally shocked by what he saw. There in the middle of town square was a minister tied to a whipping post, his back laid bare and bloody with the bones of his ribs showing. He had been scourged mercilessly like Yahushua with whips laced with metal. Patrick Henry is quoted as saying, When they stopped beating him, I could see the bones of his rib cage. I turned to someone and asked what the man had done to deserve such a beating as this. Scourged for not taking a license. The reply given him was that the man being scourged was a minister who refused to take a license. He was one of twelve who were locked in jail because they refused to take a license. A license often becomes an arbitrary control by government that makes a crime out of what ordinarily would not be a crime. It turns a right into a privilege. Three days later, they scourged him to death. This was the incident which sparked the Natsari attorney Patrick Henry to write the famous words which later became the rallying cry of the revolution. Quote, What is it that gentlemen wish? What would they have? Is life so dear or peace so sweet as to be purchased at the price of chains and slavery? Forbid it, Almighty L. I know not, or yeah, I know not what course others may take, but as for me, give me liberty or give me death. And this is from a man who knew scripture, and he knew that it was liberty to do his word, like Yahushua, the son of Nun, in, in Yahushua 1.8. No man shall stand before you all the days of your life, but if you meditate on his word day and night so that you see to do all that is in it, then you shall make your way prosperous and, and act rightly. And you'll be successful in all you put your hand to do. But that's why it also says where the Ruach of Yahuwah is, there is liberty. Okay. 
Later, he made this part of his famous speech at St. John's Episcopal Assembly in Williamsburg, Virginia. Jury of Peers Our forefathers felt that in order to have right ruling or justice, it was obvious that a jury of peers must be people who actually know the defendant. How else would they be able to judge motive and intent? Peers of the defendant, like the rights of the jury, have also been severely tarnished. Originally, it meant people of equals in station and rank, Black Law's Dictionary 1910. Freeholders of a neighborhood, Bovier's Law Dictionary 1886. Or a, a companion, a fellow, an associate, Webster's 1828 Dictionary of the English Language. Who has the right to sit on a jury? Patrick Henry, along with others, was deeply concerned as to who has a right to sit on a jury. Listen to our forefathers' wisdom on the subject of peers. Mr. Henry. By the Bill of Rights of England, a subject has a right to a trial by his peers. What is meant by his peers? those who reside near him, his neighbors, not strangers that don't know you, which is what you see in almost every court today, right? Who And who are well acquainted with his character and situation in life. Patrick Henry, El Niot, the debates in the several state conventions on the adoption of the federal constitution. 3, section 579. Patrick Henry also knew that originally the jury of peers was designed as a protection for neighbors from outside governmental oppression. Henry states the following. Why do we love this trial by jury? Because it prevents the hand of oppression from cutting you off. This gives me comfort that as long as I have existence, my neighbors will protect me. Mr. Holmes. Mr. Holmes from Massachusetts argued strenuously that for justice or right ruling to prevail, the case must be heard in the vicinity where the fact was, was committed by a jury of peers. A jury of the peers would from the local or from their local situation have an opportunity to form a judgment of the character of the person charged with the crime and also to judge of the credibility of the witnesses. Mr. Wilson. Mr. Wilson, signer of the unanimous declaration, who also later became a Supreme Court justice, stressed the importance of the jurors knowing personally both the defendant and the witnesses where juries can be acquainted with the characters of the parties and the witnesses, where the whole cause can be brought within their knowledge and their view. I know no mode of investigation equal to that of a trial by jury. They hear everything that is alleged. They not only hear the words, but they see and mark the features of the countenance. They can judge the weight due to such testimony. And moreover, it is a cheap and expeditious manner of distributing justice. There is another advantage annexed by or annexed to the trial by jury. The jurors may indeed return a mistaken or ill-founded verdict, but their errors cannot be systematical, meaning they won't be jurors for every case. Freedom for William Penn. It says, those people who are not governed by Elohim will be ruled by tyrants. William Penn. Edward Bushel and three fellow jurors learned this lesson well. They refused to bow to the court. They believed in the absolute power of the jury, though their eight companions cowered to the court. 
the four jurors spent nine weeks of torture in prison, with often without food or water, soaked in urine, smeared with feces, barely able to stand, and even threatened with fines. Yet they would not give in to the judge. Edward Bushell said, My liberty is not for sale. Though he had great wealth and commanded an international shipping enterprise, these bumbleheads, so the court thought, proved the power of the people was stronger than any power of government. They emerged total victors. And I'd like to put out Edward Bushell and his companions. They actually were tortured. They suffered for standing for the truth when they didn't have protection. We have no such qualms or no things to fear from the people today. The jury can put a not guilty vote with no repercussions. And it's only cowardice through no reason whatsoever. When you're not being tortured or, or smeared in your own feces or having soaked urine on you, there is absolutely no excuse for capitulating to tyranny. It says the First Amendment. The year was 1670, and the case Bushel sat on was that of William Penn, who was on trial for violation of the Conventicle Act. This was an elaborate act which made the Church of England the only legal assembly, and it was a high Catholic, or it was a high church party, Anglican church, which was really a Catholic light, just an infiltrated Catholic usurpation. All of this was to oppress the people and to keep them under religious tyranny, but it wasn't going to stand. It says the act was struck down by their not guilty vote. Freedom of religion was established and became part of the English Bill of Rights, and later it became the First Amendment to the Constitution of the United States. Small u. In addition, the right to peaceful assembly was founded, freedom of speech, and also habeas corpus. The first such writ of habeas corpus ever issued by the Court of Common Pleas was used to free Edward Bushel. Later, this trial gave birth to the concept of freedom of the press. Had Bushel and his colleagues yielded to the guilty verdict sought by the judge and prosecutor, William Penn most likely would have been executed as he clearly broke the law. Hold up. Hold up. All right. Just one moment. All right. And we're just going to finish up the last two paragraphs here for the, the context of the theme being spoken of, and then we'll continue next time with reading this citizen's rule book. Okay. This says he broke the law. Then there would have been no Liberty Bell, no Independence Hall, no city of Philadelphia, which is brotherly love, and no state called Pennsylvania. For young William Penn, founder of Pennsylvania and leader of the Quakers, was on trial for his life. His alleged crime was preaching and teaching a different view of the Bible than that of the Church of England. This appears innocent today, but then one could be executed for such actions, and it was only, it was only Catholics that persecuted those of dissent. It wasn't honest, real believers that followed scripture. You can't prove it by his word. He said, if my kingdom was now of this world, my people would fight. But it is not now of this world. And it was not for his people to fight yet. That's still true. And again, it's only hypocrites that do to men what they wouldn't want done to themselves. It says, this appears innocent today, but then one could be executed for such actions. He believed in freedom of religion, freedom of speech, and the right to peaceful assembly. He had broken the government's law, but he had injured no one. Those four heroic jurors knew that only when 
actual injury to someone's person or property takes place, is there a real crime? You want to keep in mind that a real property of someone is their character. So if you defame someone, if you slander them, that's actually a crime that was punishable under the common law in our country. It says no law is broken when no injury can be shown. Thus, there can be no loss or termination of rights unless actual damage is proven. Many imposter laws were repealed as a result of this case. It is almost unfair. This trial made such an impact that every colony but one established jury as the first liberty to maintain all other liberties. It was felt that the liberties of people could never be wholly lost as long as the jury remained strong and independent, and that unrighteous laws and statutes could not stand when confronted by consciences or conscientious jurors. Jurors to today face an avalanche of imposter laws. Jurors not only still have the power and the right, but also the duty to nullify bad laws by voting not guilty. At first glance, it appears that it is almost unfair the power jurors have over government, but necessary when considering the historical track record of oppression the governments have yielded, or wielded rather, over private citizens. And with that, we will call that a night. So thank you all for joining us, and hopefully... Ob willing, you're all edified. Everyone that hears this can learn and we can start questioning the things that are going on and helping to put a stop to it. It's going to take us coming together as the people, coming together in grand juries to investigate these criminals in office and indict them, remove them from office and have them tried for crimes and treason if they will not start doing their job. So thank you for your time. You have a wonderful night and uh, we'll see you next time.